All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. This is Guy McPherson of the Nature Pets Last YouTube channel, which is how you found us. And today I'm chatting again with Peter Miller. And I'm going to introduce us as usual. And 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 then we're going to have a conversation because based on a conversation from a couple of weeks ago, there was at the very least a misunderstanding and probably... I can best explain that by I screwed up because I can't use the F word here on YouTube. Okay. In our conversation from two weeks ago, and we didn't have one a week ago because uh, my computer has completely failed me. And so after only six or seven years, you know, built in obsolescence. So I had to get another one. We're in the process of downloading the information, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, in our online conversation two weeks ago, I said something like, even if we could somehow gather together in a united front to battle climate change, it's too late. And if I if I were to say that another way, I would say there's a lot of scientific data and evidence suggesting Earth's ecosystem decline and imminent collapse, but we don't know exactly how and when that will all take place. And so there are things that we don't know. And, and an example, I want to bring up is a mistake that I made when I interpreted the 2012 issue of the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And the Annual Review series is very scientifically conservative. It only comes out with one issue per year. So the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences that came out in 2012 the last data point they had was from 2009, which dragged down the linear projection. It was much lower in terms of the amount of Arctic sea ice than the previous years had been. So when, when they created a linear projection from this thing through this point, which dragged it down a bit, they came up with we would have an ice-free Arctic Ocean in 2016 plus or minus three years. And obviously we didn't, or we wouldn't be having this conversation mm -hmm. because the stunningly rapid rate of environmental change in the wake of that event would mean it's game over for our species and probably for all species on the planet. So that would be inconvenient. So I interpreted that, you, you, could, you could say that I interpreted that linear aggression too precisely or incorrectly or whatever you want to call it, we didn't have an ice-free Arctic Ocean in 2016 plus or minus three years. So here we are. So uh, we talked about those as misconceptions last time around, and we wanted to clarify what, what, what I mostly, or to use the royal we, that we um maybe didn't put enough nuance into is that is that about right peter peter miller psychologist from canada <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love the heading <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> after all peter's just another human uh like um but like um and i'm always striving to understand things better and to and to work on myself uh and to be as helpful as I can be with what I know in the world. And um, and I really enjoy continuing to engage with Guy McPherson about pursuing that and and, and, and trying to, uh, to work with and understand the, the material and all the, the, the rich uh, uh, research. Like, I mean, um, all the different forms of research and how you put it together into a message um, I think there's, I continue to think that there's lots of truth to what you have shared in your books and in your um, classes um, and all the different seminars that you've done in different places uh, over the years. Um, but I guess uh, along the way, as, as you've been doing that, I, I guess I've gathered through my observations that it's possible for people to easily misinterpret things. It's possible for people to get maybe carried away with uh, misunderstanding. And I, so with these discussions currently, I'm, I'm hoping to, 
yeah, to focus in on some of the nuance and the ways people word things. Uh, and just, I guess it's just part of our limitations as humans. I think we all need to acknowledge that. Like we have these limitations about perception and language and interpretation. And um, so things can easily get misconstrued. People can easily get like um, uh, disturbed or upset, right? Um, so we need to keep clarifying like what it is that we're talking about. And even like what the language of science is like, um, like is, is science a perfect discipline? And I don't think it is. I think it's pro I think it's the best that we got for trying to figure out what happens like in all different kinds of realms and the scientific method, it can be, it can be applied very well. It can be applied not very well, right? Like some, some researchers do it much better than others and they, right. and, they, and, and, they and they also write things about their research much better. And when the application includes technology, things can go seriously awry, right? Because when you use science to create technology, well, we can name all kinds of problems that arise from various technologies we've created from bombs, just starting with swords, bombs, knives, whatever, right? That, that tend to tear us apart instead of bring us together. as a species mm -hmm. or as mm -hmm. life forms. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'll also add in, and we were kind of mentioning this before the video, like uh, in the context that we're in an industrial civilization, in my experience as a therapist in a meeting with hundreds of people, uh, if not thousands by now, is that there are certain voids in learning and understanding that, that prevent us from being wholly human. Um, so like we have limitations in understanding mental health, we have limitations in understanding emotions, limitations in communication, uh, limitations in being able to have personalities work together very well. So these are, it's probably across the board, right? Like if you are in industrial civilization, you've probably come up with, you've probably come against these uh, deficits and these neglects in your, in your life experience. And so then when you try and communicate in your adulthood, assuming that you have everything you need, you don't, right? Like you just don't. Um, and I'm continuing to recognize and realize all of my deficits from, from uh, my childhood experience, always trying to add more tools, whatever I can add. <clears throat> so uh, in, in, in addition to the scientific method being the best that we got but still somewhat imperfect we also have to recognize that uh, we have these limitations that also are another layer right in trying to understand and communicate what this is all about and um uh what to conclude when 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 it's like not wise to conclude certain things um and so i guess what i wanted to interject into the whole thing was one of my favorite phrases and i don't think people use very much is that when they say or they're willing to say I don't know, right? Like, so we can know some things to a certain extent, but there's always this, I don't know. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. In fact, that's a fundamental pillar of science, the ability to say, I don't know, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because if we know everything, then there's no need for more science. Science is, after all, a means of discovering the nature of the universe. If we know everything, we can stop right now. Even when there's research done, don't they have a confidence interval? Can you explain that, what that's all about? Well, that generally goes along with statistics, and that's why the 2012 issue of the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences had an article called The Future of Arctic Sea Ice, and they projected an ice-free Arctic Ocean in 2016, plus or minus three years. recognizing that they can't pin it down to the year, much less the day, right? Mm -hmm. So interestingly, after being pretty incorrect in their approach or the assessment, the a, a, a group of researchers directed by the same researcher, Vislav Maslowski, has come up with a 
six month ensemble forecast. So a prediction rather than a projection that is much shorter term. So we will know sometime probably the first week of April or so. And that's the way it's been for the last two years that they've had this six month ensemble forecast. So we'll know sometime within the first month, first week of April, what the forecast is for Arctic sea ice in late September. And that will tell us a lot about what we can expect in terms of habitat for our species and others in the wake of the ice free Arctic Ocean. But and when they make their conclusions, this there's I I guess from my schooling, I just remember there was a 95% confidence interval and then 98. Is that right? Like there's better. Right. Yes, absolutely. There's there's people use 90, 95, 99. Those are the most common ones, 90% confidence interval. And what that means is, let's see, let's see if we can draw this out. So say we we conclude that their line is going to go like this and say, here's 2025. So two years from now, this thing is going to cross the line. Well, if we use something with without very much certainty, it can be pretty, pretty tight bars on that conclusion. But at the 99% confidence interval, to fall on that line with 99% accuracy, it's going to be plus or minus a bit more. Mm. Does that make sense? As best as I can. I was never great at statistics. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, well, the bottom line is that the statistical approach recognizes that we can't be precise with 100% accuracy. We can't be exactly dead on all the time. And so the more precision you want, you have to give up some of the variation, some of the confidence. In, right. And that's why they're called confidence intervals. So the, the, the more correct you want to be, then you have to give up some of that precision. Right. So, um, so I guess what I'm wanting to really bring today, in, in psychology, we call it being dialectical. So like on the one hand, you can be very confident about a potential outcome on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you still don't know, right? So there's like, it's because this constant interplay between uh, stating the likelihood and then also admitting or acknowledging we still, we can't know 100% exactly how things are going to turn out or when or how or or even if they will at all in the way that we suspect, right? right? Like, so um, I think it's right. important for people to bring this into their thinking, especially about near-term human extinction, so that they can not get carried away in all of the different cognitive distortions and, un and go down un unnecessary rabbit holes and want to do drastic things, right? So let me give an example. Last year, the six-month ensemble forecast indicated <clears throat> early on that there would be, it would be quite a bit further out before we'd have a, a nice free Arctic Ocean. I don't remember the exact dates, but it was quite a bit further out. It was later in September. There was less, uh, less chance of having a nice free Arctic Ocean early on. But then the El Nino Southern Oscillation came along and started to churn up the ocean, the Arctic Ocean, and that closed the gap a little bit. Obviously, still didn't take us to an Arctic Ocean, but made it made the total amount of ice on the Arctic Ocean far less than the prediction had been from just two months earlier. So an unexpected uh, variable. Right. right. Saying, right. Yes. Yes. They. They. Either the the forecast doesn't have the ability to account for the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or they didn't work it in correctly. I don't know enough about the projection to know. So the, I I think what you're saying is there's always this potential. It could be an unexpected variable that makes the situation worse, 
or it could be an unexpected variable that makes the situation not as bad as we thought. It, it could always be one or the other. Right. And, and I would say that from a personal standpoint, we have the ability to be the, the, the variable that makes things better, or we can make things worse with any relationship that we have. Right. And, I, yes. and, and, and it seems like a lot of people spend most of their time trying to make every relationship worse. <laughs> or not knowing how to make it better. Right. Um, right. Oh, that's how a psychologist would say it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess I've, I, from my experience, I've learned that people, they usually lack understanding, skills, strength that would help them to do things in a different way. I, I guess you have to have the one emote. You have to have, you have to want, or you have to have the motivation to want to do things better. Right. Like, so, I mean, if you have that motivation, I have this free course, by the way, <laughs> called right. free, free BPD course. Uh, it's at freebpdcourse.com. And if you are motivated and you are interested in learning how to learn how to be human in a different way and to work through and overcome certain kinds of disorder, check it out. Uh, and there, and, there and tell, it, tell us again what BPD means and, and w the frequency with which it applies to people. Um, BPD, from my reference point, uh, sometimes people call it bipolar, but in my, from my reference point, I'm I'm helping with borderline personality disorder, um, and it is um, a, an issue of having a different genetic predisposition to be more emotionally sensitive, uh, and also having experiences that could uh, influence that part of the brain, either in your childhood development or early adulthood, like traumas and whatnot. Um, and then you need to, you have to require some skills to learn how to live in your body in a certain kind of way, um, so that you're not, uh, misperceiving things and acting on misperception too much, because that leads to chaos and drama and relationship breakdown, everything that people don't want usually. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the tragic thing is that many people go into their adult life, not knowing that this is even an issue, not knowing that they have been, um, shortchanged, not knowing that they didn't acquire all the learning and skills that they needed to acquire, assuming that their parents knew everything when they didn't about their particular situation. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's about uh, probably four to six percent of the population, which when you when you factor that into a whole country like the states, that's going to mean like millions and millions and millions right? Like of well, people that need these um, desperately need these things. Well, yeah, and not only that, but it, say it's 5%. If you interact with 20 people in your life, then you're going to encounter at least one, right? And the percentage Again, can even be higher, actually, because there's lots of undocumented cases, right? Of so, course, of course. And most of us interact with a lot more than 20 people. <laughs> so um, so there's, there's, there's great certainty that we're going to interact with somebody or that, that we ourselves have bipolar disorder. Or borderline, a combination. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I get it wrong every time. Uh, bipolar is more of an organic uh, brain issue that, that is best treated through medication. Um, borderline, uh, there's no specific medication for it. It's mostly you need therapy and to learn a set of skills. Mm -hmm. um, and it is treatable. And that is what is important for people to understand. It takes some time and some hard work, but it's definitely doable uh, to do that. Um, so uh, thank you for letting me con continue to bring that uh, opportunity for people to learn into these discussions. I, I, my, from learning about everything you've taught me and learning about living in industrial civilization, I really think that is large and it, it is in large part, maybe not entirely, it's a cost of doing business. It's mm -hmm. a way, a way humans have been impacted from living in this context. It's a way humans have been shortchanged and being um, disrupted uh, from whatever um, money being the top priority. <clears throat> and I could be, I, I admit, I, I could be somewhat wrong in that regard, but why else would you have so much neglect to childhood development? People right. are, pre they're preoccupied with trying to learn how to make money because that's right. how you, that's how you get the, your needs met in this culture, right? And if you can't do it, basically you're homeless or you die right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or both <laughs> or both uh so anyway people end up being preoccupied and as parents to achieve that goal so they only have so much time with their children in many cases mm -hmm. and they don't have the time to learn things that would help their children 
Um, so, I mean, I could get on my soapbox and rant all day, but I'll stop there. <laughs> I remember the name of the person. Stephen Gardner has the book, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences. Mm -hmm. And that book covers his multiple intelligences, the, the different ways people have of interpreting the world. And he points out that we all have the ability to improve in all of those categories. So we can all improve with respect to interpersonal communication, right? We can always become better at communicating with other people. We can all become better at intrapersonal communication, at the ability to sit out in the wilderness and ponder the meaning of our own lives and what our what our place is in the universe. We have the ability to do those things. Some people are born with, with better skills than others. For example, when it comes to kinesthetic intelligence, Michael Jordan is doing great. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but most of the rest of us don't do nearly as well as Michael Jordan <laughs> when it comes to the kinesthetics. <laughs> right. I mean, luckily, we don't need that level of kinesthetics to, to meet all our basic needs. Thank right. goodness. Uh, we'd all be doomed <laughs> if we needed that level. Um, you know, I, I, as you were speaking there, it reminded me, I had a psychiatrist once in a hospital when I was just starting out in my psychology and uh, getting my uh, supervised hours done. He said, he said to me, Peter, if you, he said, figure out interpersonal psychology. That's what he said to me. Uh, because that is where he was also seeing where a lot of the problems and deficits are. It's interpersonal communication. Um, and so, I mean, like a bit of an insider, like before our video here, I was like saying, hey, guy, I noticed these discrepancies. Let's sort this out, right? Like, let's do an mm -hmm. interpersonal experience. Um, where we can just talk about the wordings and the nuances uh, and actually clear up some of these misunderstandings. Um, so I, I'm, I'm assuming, Guy, that you're you're willing to admit maybe some of the wordings you've used could be adjusted to... to of course. To... Of course. Consider, for example, when I was routinely quoting that 2012 issue of Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences, this, this is among the most scientifically conservative peer-reviewed journals out there and it comes out once a year and so when they projected an ice free arctic in 2016 plus or minus three years i concluded that it's pretty interesting because the first time i saw that paper referenced in the corporate media i think it was in usa today and they their their subhead was 84 years ahead of schedule Right. Mm -hmm. So 2016 plus or minus three years meant we were going extinct 84 years of head, ahead of schedule, uh, you know, because Earth has a schedule for us. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, it's not and it's, so it's not just your wordings either. Right. I mean, it's it's the it's the the uh, what's that environmental organization, that important one. Uh, they use they use sometimes extreme wordings as well. Right. Like, oh, yes. Uh, Everybody does. That's how yeah. you get attention with the headline, right? <laughs> right, right. I mean, that's what we've been, and and this is another reminder that we were not made for this world. <laughs> Much less were the youngsters in our lives right. made for this world, because it's not a black and white world. It's not all binary. It's a lot more nuanced than that. It's a lot more confusing than that. That's And that's the integrity and the honesty that is uh, really nice. To actually hear uh so and i don't know if everyone would say that in that in that honest way um so like so we have this, but parts of what you've said in your books and in your classes and in, in your big essay at nature Bass, parts of it hold true like it's not you can't discount the whole thing like some of the scariest parts hold true <laughs> you know like, so on the uh, on the other hand we don't know exactly how and when and and if there will even is it fair to say we don't know we we don't know if there will be an extinction event i don't are you okay with that like oh but, uh, well well it depends on what you mean by that we are in the midst of a mass extinction event a mass extinction event is defined as one that causes the extinction of a certain number of species typically so, between 70 and 80 percent so, so that that's one of the part that holds true so, yes right? okay. yes absolutely 
Uh, and cause, and because yes, it's, it's been observed certain numbers of species go extinct every day, right? That's, right. That's yes. a fact. That's an undeniable fact. Right. And okay. and where it gets tricky is we're uh, eight other species in our genus, the genus Homo, have already gone extinct. Almost all of them because of dramatic changes in planetary temperature yeah, and yeah. almost all of them because of dramatic increases in planetary temperature now the current and ongoing rate of human driven change far exceeds the rates of change driven by geophysical or biosphere forces in the past so that tells me that because of the very rapid rate of change that's going on right now, that's driving other species to extinction, that that we are hovering on the brink. But maybe we'll come up with a miracle. For that, for for a few years, I thought that the mirror reflection project, which you can find at m e e r dot org, that's mirrors for Earth's energy rebalancing. That's what the M-E-E-R stands for. I thought that was the way forward. I thought that that was going to save us because it was it has the ability to bounce back the radiation from the sunlight before it warms up the planet. But that was a long time ago. And... I watched this uh, video from Eckhart Tolle once, uh, and he said it's really it's really hard to determine how things will unfold because. There's the exchange of information is so rapid and so massive right now, like with the internet and everyone doing this interaction thing. So there's a whole bunch of harmful information, right? <laughs> and then you have a whole bunch of like other helpful information going out there. And it's almost like a war for lack of a better word. I don't know like if that's even a good analogy, but like there's all this complexity of information and humans receiving this information every day, right? And it seems to be compounding as we go on and it's like what will this do it's almost it seems like we're like in las vegas <laughs> right I, and like there's so many you mentioned unknown variables right like there's it seems like there's a lot of those potentially and what someone might come up with or what someone some group might start doing like it's there's just so many possibilities but that still doesn't erase everything that you have compiled with and all the scientific literature and all the dots that you've it, dots connected it still doesn't erase that like right right those th that's still tr there's a lot holds true there right. so i guess it's all about just trying to like bring together the reality of the unknowns and the reality of all the truths that you've compiled and somewhere in the middle or somewhere down that path we will end up right <laughs> yes and and that's difficult Right. It's difficult to put all this information together. It's difficult to go beyond the statistics with which we're familiar. It's difficult to go beyond the language with which we're familiar. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're in the midst of a mass extinction event. That means a certain number of species are going extinct at a certain rate. That's true. And is it is it also true that species are discovered or or come about? Oh yeah. Yes. There's there's the, the three pillars of conservation biology are speciation. So when and with what predecessors a new species comes into existence, that's speciation. Extinction, which is when the last individual of a species dies, and habitat, which is all the information that is provided for the existence of the mm. species that are here now. And the habitat varies from species to species and from population to population. Is speciation and extinction equal or one more than the other? No, no. Because we're in a mass extinction event, the rate of extinction is far exceeding the rate of speciation. Okay. Like by hundreds of times. Okay. So okay. if we're not in a mass extinction event, they would be approximately balanced. A species goes extinct species comes into being at approximately the same rate. And at certain times in planetary history, there were these massive blossoming, blossomings of new species. Just these conditions were right so that a whole bunch of new species came into existence at the same time. Right. 
what we're seeing is the opposite of that today, and that's why we call it a mass extinction event, and we're in at least the ninth mass extinction event. People refer to it as the sixth mass extinction all the time, but if you look through the peer-reviewed literature, you can find not five previous ones, but eight previous ones. So it's almost like another piece of this is that it's a normal part of being on this planet. Yes. This is this is what this planet does. Absolutely. Uh, it's almost like it's normal for people to die. It's normal for this planet to go through extinction events. It happens. Yes. Everybody dies. Mm -hmm. Every species goes extinct. <laughs> Every, everybody who lives dies. Every species that comes into existence becomes extinct. So mm -hmm. the only issue is one of timing for all of that, right? Is how long you live and how long I live as individuals and how mm -hmm. long our species hangs on as a species. Yeah, that seems like a really important piece for mental health because if, I mean, if we can say to ourselves, well, it's not just our, uh, our, our, our species of this species, <laughs> or what do you call it, our iteration of this species, like it, it 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 happens regardless of whether you're, I guess, in industrial civilization or not. It's nature will find a way. That's what it sounds right. like to say. Right. Yes. Nature finds a way to live. Nature finds a way to die. And then right. do it all over again. <laughs> do right. it all yes. over again. <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. So I mean, if you're beating yourself up about like, you know, your contribution to extinction, really keep that in mind, you know. Like <laughs> Oh. Oh, absolutely. I tell people this all the time. Most of us are are said to be given the task of conserving, conserving natural resources, making sure we don't burn all the fossil fuels so we don't continue to heat the, heat the planet. But some some individuals, the billionaires, apparently are responsible for maintaining aerosol masking. And so they jet around in their private jets and they maintain aerosol masking and that blocks incoming solar radiation and keeps the planet cooler. So right. those billionaires have their jets and we have the ability to conserve. And it seems like there's very little overlap between us and the billionaires. <laughs> You're right. Even though that, I guess they help in that regard a lot more. <laughs> in a way, yes. Our discussion also reminds me of a, a, a stand-up comedy routine by George Carlin. He was talking about the earth and nature and kind of like how earth could brush us off like fleas in an instant if it wanted to. I can't remember exactly, but it's on YouTube. Right. It's it's very funny. Yes. Um, and and he says, people send this to me at least once a week, by the way. It annoys the crap out of me. <laughs> because what he says is na nature is just going to do its thing. It's going to wipe some species out. New species are going to come into existence. The earth isn't going anywhere. We are. That's a right. signature line. Right. But when we leave, by the way, we're taking all species with us for a couple of different reasons. The rate of environmental change in our wake is going to be so fast that other species are not going to be able to keep up. And more than 400 nuclear power plants are going to melt down. That ionizing radiation is going to go into that atmosphere, strip, strip away stratospheric ozone and superheat the planet. So... Yeah. It's not just that we're going away, it's that we're taking everything with us. And and that's the that's what really bothers me. You know, I'm old and I knew I was gonna die. <laughs> from from the time I was 12, I knew that I was gonna die. And so I know that I'm gonna die, and I've I've had the opportunity to have a pretty good run. I hear I, I hear all that, and it I mean the frustration, the disappointment with this iteration of humans and the technology that seems to be all consuming, right? For destruction. Mm -hmm. um, can we can we, according to our discussion today, put in the last note that we don't know what nature has up its sleeve for another iteration? Absolutely. Because we don't, because <laughs> nature is amazing. That that we were given the opportunity to have this life is incredible as individuals and as a species. There's no reason that our species had to come into existence. That's, you could argue that that was a series of accidents through evolution that caused us to be the amazing species we are. And you can interpret amazing as amazingly <laughs> good or amazingly bad. And yeah. we all we all see both of them all the time. I'll right? do this. That, that's <laughs> right. <what I> mean. <laughs> right. 
but right. to the extent it's possible for us, we can choose. Right. Yeah. To the extent we have we free will, we can choose to be decent people or not. And I see a lot of people who choose not. Yeah. And um, so hopefully, yeah, these, these discussions and these videos can bring about some of that kind of influence, right? Where people will maybe take a path to live in a different way with the time that we have. Um, and maybe they will contribute in some way to something miraculous, unexpected, right? That, right. Uh, that hey, uh, happen, can happen. Miracles happen. I read about them all the time. <laughs> Right. And I, and if, if, if anything, from what I've observed from you and your work is you're always open to new information and uh, you're always looking for it. Um, Absolutely. And so, and it's um, not all bad. I don't look specifically for bad information. I'm really <laughs> looking for good news. Yes. So, to, so to, to actually, to try and follow that, uh, what Guy is doing for, as for, as a viewer, try and be open to the, uh, what tomorrow brings because we really don't know right and for people right. who have passed on and given up maybe partially from hearing this kind of information and misconstruing it misperceiving it like shit you're not gonna like be able to smell that flower watch that new movie listen to that new song fall in love with that person like don't you there's still stuff to experience here right so hold on right right and in the iliad Homer pointed out that the gods envy us specifically for that reason. The gods envy us mere mortals because we get to die. What that mm -hmm. means is we get to appreciate the smell of the rose. We get to appreciate the view of the swan going by. The gods never get to do that. The gods live forever. Why would they stop to sniff a flower? Mm -hmm. there's, there's billions of more flowers to come. Yes. On the flower. <laughs> Right. I think I think this year is going to hold lots of fun things, and uh, <laughs> I'm even I'm even aiming to visit Guy McPherson one day. It's going to happen. <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> awesome. And why don't you give us a short wrap up of your free course? Sure. And then, then we'll wrap this up. So, if you are eager and interested to learn more about mental health and emotions, and specifically borderline personality, but also be informed about any kind of uh, general mental health condition or be assisted in uh, learning how to manage these things in a more improved way, check out uh, my website at freebpdcourse.com. It outlines my experience uh, with uh, mental health challenges in the past, everything that I learned to overcome and even more because I've included information from other professionals in there and a whole host of tools and resources that um, you can use on the go, like in, a, in this mobile world um, to work on things when you have time. So again, that's at free bpdcourse.com. I'm getting good at these infomercials. I must say. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Thank you for that. And let's wrap it right there. And I look forward to chatting with you next week, assuming that the computer world doesn't completely melt down in my life. Sounds great.